Our theme for the year is double down. And so we're just doubling down on some truths, things that we believe in, things that things that are in my heart that I am wanting to convey to you, that I'm wanting to put in your heart, put in your spirit. And uh, and and one of those one of those concepts is learning how to trust in God, learning how to trust him. And I'm going to dig into that for a little bit today, and I hope that you will that you will go there with me and get something to write with and just just make yourself some notes, put it in your phone, however you do it. Um, but there there is nothing. I believe this with all my heart. There is nothing that God can't do for somebody that learns to trust in him. Somebody that learns to trust him. There's an old song that we used to sing when I was a kid, and it's a lot older than me. So don't think I wrote it. But it just goes like this. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word and just to rest upon his promise. Just to Thus saith the Lord, oh Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him, oh. Like this one too. I'm so glad I learned to trust Him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that Thou. Lift your voice and sing it with me. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and for grace oh for grace to trust you more if 
Father, we come to you right now. We ask that you would give us the grace to learn to trust you more, to trust you with our lives, to, to give you the power to do what you want to do in us, to be God in us. Help us, Lord, to release you. As Josh said this morning, to not just give you more room, but to give you residence, to let you come to take over and do what you have desired to do in our lives since the very beginning. Help us to give you permission to do that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. You can be seated. Thank you. You know, um, it wasn't long after my daughter <clears throat> uh, really started learning to walk and then run uh, that we were in our old building, and it was after church on one Sunday, and we were just standing around the stage area talking, and all of a sudden, uh, Jade says to me, Dad. And when I turned around, without warning, from the back of the stage, she lit out in a full-blown run and got to the edge of the stage and with all four limbs out, leaped into my arms. And it was no catch me, Dad. It was no, no warning, no nothing. She just took off running with her eyes locked on me and jumped into the air, and she just knew that Dad was going to catch her. My dad was standing there, and he started laughing, and he said to me, if that is not a picture of what God is asking for, he said there was just no doubt in her mind that her dad was going to catch her. I have never forgotten that image, and it's happened to me over and over on other occasions. Just a couple of weeks ago, little Mila, uh, Pastor Meyer and Sarah's daughter, was standing here on the stage, and I just looked at her, and I held my hand out like that, and with no hesitation, she jumped into my arms. And it's like over and over, God keeps reminding us, is there anybody who will just trust me that much? I hear the words of Jesus when he said, if you, come on, dads, if you being evil, wrestling with all of your imperfections, all of your sin, all your mistakes, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father, who, by the way, doesn't have any sin, it has no imperfections, who is perfect, how much more will he want to do for and catch and love on and bless those who ask him for it? God is desperately seeking for people who will trust him. And how do we communicate that to God? The way we communicate that is through prayer. It's through prayer. Prayer cannot truly exist without faith. If you don't have faith that God is listening, you're probably not going to pray. When you pray, you are believing that there is a God on the other end of that line, that spiritual line that is listening, and you believe that he is going to hear what you're saying and possibly make a difference. Even if your faith is just a fledgling faith, you have some kind of belief that maybe God is listening and maybe he will hear what I'm saying and do what I need him to do. Faith moves prayer along. It gives prayer color and tone. It shapes its character. It secures its results. But faith is not where we stop. Because the next thing that enters following faith is this thing called trust. Trust is the next level of faith. And I want to talk to you today about trusting through tough times. 
trusting through tough times. You know that with your faith, your faith can be up one day, it can be down the next. There are times that it can be a bit like a roller coaster. I got strong faith one day, and the next day my faith is a little bit low. But there is something about trust that even when faith ebbs and flows, when we find trust, it's like this bedrock of an undercurrent. It's, it, it, it's this deep thing that, that even when everything has fallen apart around us and we are pressed in that moment, there is something deep down in here that causes us to to, to dig a little deeper and find a trust in God. When my faith is wavering, I, I can go a little bit deeper and I can find this trust. And if I don't have it yet, then the only way that I find trust is through intimacy. Josh was really on something this morning in his little exhortation during worship that, that this, this intimacy is what causes us to be able to find our faith in and our trust in God. You only trust someone that you have entered into an intimate type relationship with. You have spent time together. You've gone through some things together. It can be it can be a, a, a brothers on the battlefield. It can be a husband and wife. It can be siblings that have grown up together. There is a trust factor there because you have been been through some stuff together you have you have communicated at a very intimate level some of the deep truths of your heart some of the struggles of your psyche of your soul you 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 have let them know some things about you that you haven't let the rest of the world know that that is an intimate type relationship that causes trust this is what God is desiring from us. Trust is faith that has become absolute. It's faith that has been ratified. It's faith that has been consummated. I will never forget the day that I transitioned. I transitioned from this place to this place. This place was a question. Am I going to live for God or not? And those, that was a question in my mind growing up. Yeah, but I, come on. Hey, you know, you're, you're PK. Yeah, I've been PK all my life, by the way. I started off preacher's kid. And then that just transitioned into Pastor Kevin. And then Pastor Kevin went to PK. So it's been PK all my life. Somebody even called me Pastor PK the other day. So now I'm Pastor Pastor Kevin. Because they thought that was my initials. But you're, you're PK. I mean, come on. You, surely, you, you, you grew up in a preacher's house. Surely that wasn't a question. Oh, yeah. I assure you. It's a question. That every preacher's kid has to answer. Every, every child of somebody that raises them in God's house has to answer. And do I believe this because I believe it? Or do I believe it because my parents believe it? Everybody has to come to God on their own faith. You got to find this in your own soul. And I went from the question... Am I going to live for God or not? And I transitioned to how hard am I going to live for God? Because that question was resolved for me. There will never, ever be a day for the rest of my life that I am not living for God. Because I have found a trust in him. I have found a deep abiding faith in him that has resolved any doubt that God loves me and that he exists and that he wants me to walk with him 
and he wants me to serve him and to love him and to live for him. That question got answered for me. And it's in that moment when you're done wondering if God is going to move on your behalf and it shifts to you just know that he's going to move now. It's just a matter of when. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. And a matter of how. Sometimes he doesn't move the way we think he's going to move. But we know that God is going to do his thing in our life. I love what King David said, and it's become one of the mantras of my life, one of the quotes of my heart to God. When David said, Lord, you will perfect that which concerns me. So many Christians today have embraced this watered-down version of faith. They, they, they don't know real trust in God. There, there are a lot of people whose faith is just anemic. I, I, I don't know how else to say it. It's, it, it, it's, it, it is, uh, it's never been allowed to grow past its, fl its fledgling state. It's, it, it, for some, it's dry. For some, it's cold. For others, it's feeble. It, it doesn't hold up against the pressures of the darkness of this world. And if we have seen anything proven during the pandemic, we have seen people's faith tested and proven. And I am not out to criticize or belittle anyone because everybody's faith has been tested during this season. For some of us, reaction has been fear. For some of us, reaction has been anger. Uh, for some, it's been frustration. For some, it's been absolute terror uh, uh, that has resulted in isolation and and we've seen just as many deaths of despair where people have died of loneliness and, and then, then we have seen and depression and anxiety than we have seen the people actually die of the disease itself. We were talking the other day uh, how that that COVID, uh, the reason why we believe that it, it absolutely has come straight out of hell is because what it has seemed to do both physically and soulishly or psychologically is it exacerbates an already existing problem. I saw the other day that a, a massive statistic, like over 70% of people who have passed away from COVID had four or more pre-existing conditions. And everybody else is coming through it. But those, those four or more, it's like that it took something that was already wrong there and it hooked up a, an air pump to it and it blew it up ten times what it already was. Same thing with us psychologically, with our souls. If, if we already struggled with doubt, it just blew it up ten times. If we already struggled with a bit of a spirit of fear, then it just blew it up ten times and caused people to begin to, to make erratic decisions, erratic behavior. This, this COVID pandemic has, has revealed problems and weak areas of our lives, both physically and psychologically and spiritually. In many people's lives, there's, there's no sure, safe trust in God. And I, I will submit to you that a big part of that is because they've been raised in a culture in the United States of America, a culture of relativism. And, and what that means is that truth is relative. It's, it's there, there are no absolute truths anymore. It's like you hear people say, what is, you know, hold, hold true to your truth. What is your truth? 
And it's like truth is now all over the place. There, that people believe there are no, there are no standards. There are, there is no absolute truth. Our universities are are, are teaching it. That's been inundated with a philosophy that undermines the absolute sovereign power of Almighty God and His Word. And if you're not sure if there even is a God, then then you're certainly going to struggle to trust him to be true to his word. And then when you can't trust his word, then he cannot move on your behalf because he's looking for faith from our hearts and trust in, in him. And, and then we continue to fall prey to the problems and the attacks of the enemy of this life. Our whole lives have become relegated to a realm of maybe and perhaps. I, I, used, to, I used to tease my kids and they would get so aggravated at me from the time they got into like junior high school, uh, high school around that area. They would come home and they'd say, Dad, this happened and I was like so mad. And I would look at him, I'd say, were you mad or were you like mad? And they would roll their eyes and click their tongues and say, Dad, so stupid. And I know I'm being facetious today, but you hear a generation that will say like 50 times in a paragraph. And I don't want to be an old fogey today, but I will tell you that I do believe that subconsciously it has something to do with this relativistic message that, listen, now don't say that it is. Say it's, it, it's, it, it like is. Don't, don't commit, don't, you know... Because truth is, what is your truth may not be somebody else's truth. And that is true. What is my truth? Because a lot of times we base truth on perception. Perception is reality for people, whether we like to admit it or not. It's like what you perceive to be the truth is your truth today. But can I tell you that it is this truth that's going to judge us on the last day. It's, it is this book that God will open at the judgment. Somebody told me one time that I, 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 you know, I don't feel convicted of that. And I said, your conviction is not the litmus test. It's what God's word says that is the litmus test. God is not going to say when I get to heaven and I stand before the throne and he's making decisions as to where I spend my eternity, he's not going to say, now let me look down your list of convictions and see if you lived by all of them. He's not going to do that. He's going to look down his word and he's going to ask if I was obedient to his word. He's going to see people that were convicted of his word and then they disobeyed those convictions and they're not going to make it. He's going to see people that were not convicted of the word, but they obeyed it because they saw it. And they said, here it is, God, I see it in your word, and I don't, I don't understand this, but I see your word says it, so I'm going to be obedient regardless of what my emotions are saying to me, and then their emotions would eventually follow along because of, they, of their obedience. There, there is a, a power in trusting in the word of God, trusting God's word. There are absolutes in life. You say there are no more absolutes. Yes, there are. There are still absolutes. I don't know why I'm staying on this today. But as the, as the sun comes up every day, that's an absolute. Even if you can't see it because it's cloudy and raining and there's a hurricane blowing in, above those clouds, there is a sun coming up. It's, gravity still exists today. 
It still exists. You could you could form the No Gravity Club and get your T-shirts and put No Gravity with a circle, a gravity with a circle and a line through it, and be the president of the club and make up your own mantra and get on top of a building and and declare we are the No Gravity Club. And then y'all step off the building, and when you step off the building, you're going down. Whether you believe in gravity or not, because it is an absolute. There are still absolute truths in life. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. But he, for he who comes to God, must believe, watch this, two things, must believe that he is. So that's number one. I, I, I've got to find my faith to believe that God exists. And then number two, that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So number one, I got to find my faith that he exists. And number two, I've got to find my trust that he is actually listening and he's going to bless me because I'm seeking after him, because I'm pursuing him, because I'm, I'm, I'm entering into a more intimate relationship with him. That's trust. So if your faith today is found wanting, when you look inside your own soul and you do a, a faith inventory, then I want to encourage you today to find you a place of prayer and just get real with God. Just get real. Just, just start off by saying, God, listen, I'm not sure if you're out there or not, but that preacher up there said that you exist, and so here goes. I'm, I'm starting the adventure. If you're there, God, I pray that you would just help me to understand. Help me to know you. I'm struggling. I've heard people talk about you for years, but I, I'm just going to take the adventure. If you're there, God, help me to understand. Help me to know. And then pick up his word and just start reading some of the things that he already wrote to you. And some of the map instructions that he left you on how to get through life. Be honest with God. The trials of your faith are actually the seedbed for miracles and setups for your most courageous feats. The trouble that you're going through right now, the struggles that you're experiencing in life are actually setups for miracles. They are potential launching pads for God to do something in your life that will absolutely blow your mind. The pressure that you are feeling forces you to acknowledge your inability to perform and your need for God's power. When you recognize it and you acknowledge it, then God can be there for you. My, my mom wrote a, an article uh, several years ago when she just talked about our need for God. And she said, I'm going to read it real quick. She said, have you noticed that you do your most effective praying when your need is the greatest? Could it be that God allows us to be in need when we become too self-sufficient and we forget to get real with God? How can he supply our needs if we don't ever have any? I'm starting to realize that when there is a need, we get down to business and prayer and praise and making our decrees and declarations and also in resisting our enemy. It spurs me to take my position to stand and to to stand and to grab my two-edged sword, which is the word of God, and to go boldly into the throne room and present my request to God, who has already promised me, by the way, that he will supply all my need. The church that Jesus rebuked the most in Revelation 3.17 is the church that said, hey, I'm rich, I'm increased with goods, and I have need of nothing. To them, Jesus said, you know that you are wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked. 
summon it up. Our weakness and our need in life moves us to depend on God's supply. The truth is we probably wouldn't even call on God if we didn't have need at times. Let's use those needs to trust in God's supply instead of our own resources and watch God work in our behalf. Powerful writing. Years ago, my friend and I, my friend Sam and I wrote a little course that just said, Lord, we need you. We rely on you. We have no strength within us on our own. Lord, we lean on you, and we trust in you, and we acknowledge our dependence on you, Lord. It's all God's looking for. It's somebody to just begin to engage him, to say, Lord, I need you. We acknowledge our need of him. We, and then the more you press into God with your honest communication, then, then your soul and, and your faith and your trust begins to grow in strength. And then God is able to bring heaven down into your earth, the eternal realm brought down into your space of time and circumstance. I want to close with this right here and just to tell you a little story about Abraham's grandson. His name was Jacob, and Jacob had, uh, was called a deceiver. He was actually labeled a deceiver from the time of his birth. When he got old enough, he was looking for his brother's birthright, and, and he <clears throat> disguised himself. His brother was a hairy guy and an outdoorsman and a hunter, and, and Jacob put hair all over his arm uh, like a, a, from a goat from the herd, and and his father was blind, and he disguised his voice. And long story short, he stole his brother's birthright from his father. And when the Esau, his older brother, found out about it, he wanted to kill him. And so, so they, he took off running for his life. And he went to a very distant relative's house uh, named Laban, who was one of his mom's uh, uh, cousins, I believe it was, or, or her, uh, one of her kinfolks. And so he gets there, and he falls in love with uh, Laban's daughter. And, and so the, the dad says, you work seven years for the daughter, and I'll let you marry her. So he worked seven years, and then, and then uh, the father committed the, the wrong daughter to him. He said, no, you got to marry the oldest one first. So, so he married her, and then he worked another seven years, and, and he got the other daughter. And then, then a, a, a sum total of 20 years he worked for his father, but at some point, he quit trusting in God. On the way to his father's, to his father-in-law's house, he had stopped at a place and he was sleeping. And while he was sleeping with his head on a rock, God gave him a dream. And the dream was stairs and there were angels going up and down the stairs. And when he woke up, he said, surely this is the house of God. And so he named the place Bethel. Bethel, which means house of God. El being God. Bethel, the house of God. So he gets to his father-in-law. He, he, his faith grows in God. He works for 20 years. He gets deceived by his father-in-law because how many of you know whatever seeds you sow, those are, that harvest is coming back. He, he deceived his father, and then his father-in-law deceived him. 20 years have gone by, and he suddenly starts to become afraid. He's, he's not trusting in God. He, he forgot that God told him, I'm going to take care of you. He forgot that while he was in that dream, God spoke to him the same promise he had spoke to his grandfather, Abraham, to say, I'm going to make your seed like the stars of the heaven and the sands of the seashore. I'm going to bless you beyond your wildest dreams. Somewhere along the line, he lost his intimacy with God and he forgot the promise of God and he started running again. And his father-in-law, realizing he had run away and taken his daughters with him, was irate. He set off with a posse to track him down. But while they were traveling one night when they were sleeping, God spoke to Laban, Jacob's father-in-law, and said, Do not hurt Jacob when you find him, and do not try to take your daughters back home. 
So he got up with a new mission from God. He found Jacob, tracked him down. And here's what he asked Jacob. He said, Jacob, why did you leave without telling me you were going? We've worked together for 20 years. Why did you leave without telling me you were going and try to take my daughters from me so that I would never see them again? And here's what Jacob said. Because I was afraid. For I said, perhaps you would take your daughters from me by force. See, Jacob was a young man that was constantly trying to manipulate situations where God had already told him he was going to bless him. But he didn't have that trust that God really meant what he said. And finally, you know what God does? God says, Jacob, get up and follow me. You know where God told Jacob to go? He told him to go back to Bethel. Go back to Bethel. Go back to the house of God. So Jacob goes back there, and God gives him another experience at Bethel, and God reiterates his promises to him, tells him all over again, I love you. I'm going to bless you. I want to do beautiful things in your life. I'm going to bless your descendants as the stars of the heaven and the sands of the seashore. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. God reiterates because God never changes. God never changed his word. God never changed his intentions toward Jacob. Jacob's the one that kept running and kept changing, kept losing his trust. So God reminded him there, and here's, here's the funny thing. If the name Bethel, house of God, wasn't great enough, Jacob was so impacted by God that he renamed, he named an altar that he made at that moment, and he called the altar El Bethel. That, that's kind of like Pastor PK. El Bethel. I mean, how, that, that means the God of the house of God. And you know what struck me? Sometimes we have to invite God back to his own house. Sometimes we're just going through the motions. Sometimes we, we come to church, but we forget about our relationship with God. Sometimes, sometimes we're saying things with our mouth, but we've lost the true feeling and meaning with our hearts. Sometimes we're walking around at Bethel and we've left El out of Bethel. And Jacob had to invite God back to his own house. And I think that God is looking for some of us to just trust him. Maybe trust him for the first time. Maybe trust him again. The Bible says, Proverbs 3 and 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding of life. In all of your ways, acknowledge him. And he promises that he will direct your path. I don't know where you are today. Maybe, you're, maybe you've never trusted in Jesus. Maybe you're here and you don't even know if there really is a God. If, if you don't even believe there, there's a God yet, I'm not, nobody's, nobody's uh, here to beat you up about it. That's your journey with you and God. Nobody can force that upon you. And, and, and it doesn't do me any good to try to impress upon you any of the principles of this book if you haven't yet met the writer of this book, the author of this book. So my, my goal today is not to get you to change your life, your lifestyle, none of that. My goal is to introduce you to the author of this book. If you'll breathe him in, he's here today. His spirit is here. 
if you'll breathe him in and accept him as your savior and your lord if you'll believe that that he robed himself in flesh that he died on the cross for your sins and my sins and that he that he rose from the dead and is alive today and ready to move in to take residence into your heart then he will change your life and the words of this book will begin to come alive for you. Maybe you're here and you're dealing with a doctor's report that's just devastated your world, devastated your heart and your life. And your faith may be feeling low today because of the constant circumstances and reports that keep coming up and the pains that you're feeling. And my prayer today is that you would be able to take a breath and dig a little deeper and find a trust in God to believe that if God said by his stripes you were healed, that you will just know my God's going to take care of it. My God's going to take care of it. I'm getting all these negative reports, but my God gave me this report and I'm going to believe it and I'm going to stand on it and I'm going to trust in it. Some of you are having relationship problems. Some of you, your, your children are on the run. I, I, I'm talking to a mama today, a daddy, that your children are on the run and they are in trouble today and no matter how much you have tried to help them, they have pushed you away and it just seems to make matters worse and you feel nothing but hopelessness. My encouragement to you today is to stop trying to fix it with your hands, with your own intellect, with your own reasoning, with your own words. Take a breath. And say, Lord, they were your kids before they were mine, and I trust you. I just know. It's not if, God, it's when you're going to capture their hearts. Because I know that you love them more than I could ever love them. And you're going to honor my prayer for them. Some of you are dealing with marriage that's on the rocks today. And you're trying everything you know to fix it. You're, you're trying to, to, to manipulate and to, to push and pull. If I do this, maybe she'll do that. Or if I do this, maybe he'll do that. And, and I'm not saying that you don't invest, that you, that you don't register for more love conference, the commercial, get, get, get on it, get it, do it. Let's, 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 let's walk toward the miracle. But... At the end of the day, there has to be a, a, a breath and a decision to trust. Because I know that God does the impossible. He makes the impossible possible. I was so inspired this morning as I was praying that the Lord just brought to me a picture of the late, great Harriet Tubman. I've read her story before, but when I watched the movie last year, to, to see the nights that Harriet, who, who was born into slavery here in America, in that time of travesty, and she started having these, these visions. Even people around her were wondering if she was kind of losing it. And she started feeling these inclinations. And, and so one night she decides, I'm leaving. And they're telling her, you're, you're going to die. They're going to catch you and you're going to die. And she had to make a decision at that point. Do I listen to the people, even those that love me around me, that have my best interest at heart, and they're trying to talk me out of doing something dangerous because they don't want to see me get hurt? Or do I listen to what I'm feeling on the inside, what I feel God is trying to tell me? And that young lady took off and escaped the slave house where she was, and she headed into the woods. And when I tell you she did not know where she was going, she followed 
a, a voice on the inside. She would stop and she would pray and she would walk and there would be something that would tell her, stop. And she would stop. And she would, she would pray and she would listen. And we could see on the camera, if you watch the movie, as the camera would lift up and there'd be guards who would, were stationed there and God would stop her and say, go this way. And she'd go this way. And she did the impossible. And she made it to a place of refuge and a place of freedom, a free state. But that wasn't enough for her. She made around 13 trips on what would become known as the Underground Railroad and led probably somewhere around 70 enslaved people to their freedom. And they even argued with her on the, some of their trips. In the movie, one of the young men that was macho who didn't want to be led by a woman said, I'm going this way. And she said, okay, go where you want to go. And she, who was deathly afraid of the dark river at night, waded out into the river with her hands above her head carrying her little belongings. And one by one, each one of them decided that this woman is either crazy or she knows God in a way that we don't know. And they stepped out into the river and followed her chin deep waters. And they made it to freedom. I was so inspired because this is how I want to live my life. I, I want to, I, 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 too many of us are getting to these roadblocks. We're getting to these places where something falls apart in our lives and we just lose our faith. We, we, we act the same way that the world acts. We, we, we fall apart. We, we, we lose all of our, our, our faith in God and we stop walking the path that God called us to walk. Listen. Just because the devil throws something in my path, does that mean that God changes his mind about what he first called me to do? No. God, doesn't, God didn't change his mind. It's when the enemy throws something at me, I stop, I look at it, I address it, I see the problem, I take a breath and I pray. And I ask God, help me to trust you, Lord. And when he gives me a sense of what I need to do, then I step out by faith. Even if it doesn't feel like it makes sense to my reasoning mind, I trust what I feel in my heart. And since I have started doing that, my friend, in my own personal life, I have seen God do more small miracles for me than I can count. When I came to this pulpit today, I felt one thing in my heart, and that is to inspire you, to inspire you to trust Jesus. Paul said God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, and he's given us this ministry of reconciliation. And then Paul said, he said, it's as though God were speaking through me right now. I implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Let your heart be united with God's heart. Put your trust in him. Believe, have faith in God. Would you close your eyes for a moment? I know this has been a very different message for me, but I sense the Holy Spirit really reaching for somebody that is in the middle of some really tough stuff and that your miracle is already secured. It's already waiting on you, but, but God... God cannot release it without your participation. He, he needs you to trust. He needs you to have faith in him. If you've never said yes to Jesus before, or maybe it's been a long, long time, and you've been on the run, but today God brought you back to this house, and you're ready to maybe recommit your life to Jesus. Whether it's your first time or the first time in a long time, would you just lift your hand up and say, I'm ready to put my trust in Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. God bless you. There's one, there's two, there's three. Keep them up for me. Amen.
bless you, God. Thank you for your honesty. You can put your hands down. Those of you that have said, that, that have raised your hand, I'm asking you to just simply, where you are right now, just get real with God. If you're here and you are a believer, but you have not really been living like it, you've not been living by faith, you've not been walking in faith, you haven't truly been trusting God with your life or your days, You've let days go by where you're worried and you're fearful and you're making decisions based on anxiety instead of faith and trust. But you're ready to let God lead you to the next level. Would you just lift your hand for me? Just be honest. Come on. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see hands across the building. You can put your hands down. I want you to just stand with me right now, if you would, across the room. The team's going to lead us back into worship. They're just going to sing that song again. I'm, I'm, I'm making room for you today, God. I want you to, I want you to have your way. I'm making room. I'm, I'm asking you to come take over. Have your way in my life. Teach me to trust you. And as they lead us in worship, if you feel that God is drawing you into something new. Whether it's for the first time or you've been living for God for years, but you're ready for the next level. I wonder if you would just step out of your seat and come stand across the front of this building. We're just gonna worship together. We're gonna pray together before we leave today. Amen. Come on, as we worship, just let your heart respond to the Holy Spirit. Just talk to him. Tell him what you need today. That's it. He'll meet you where you are.
要算，谁的自尊啊？我们去。